When we begin a discussion on gender-based violence, it's tempting to start by talking about the statistics. Uh, the statistics of intimate partner violence, of domestic violence, of rape and murder that affect so many women and men in South Africa. I won't do that today, partly because the numbers mask the real lives that are affected, and partly because it leads us to feeling quite overwhelmed by the extent of the problem, and places us in a position of inertia. What can we really do in the face of such a massive problem? So I want to move away from the statistics and away from feeling overwhelmed to suggest that today's discussion is about what we can do. I also considered starting this discussion with reference to the women whose tragic experiences have made it into the media. But I won't go there, because while their experiences throw violence against women into the media limelight, it singles out one or two women's experiences. Today, we want to be talking about the thousands of victims and survivors of gender-based violence. So I will start today by thanking you all for being here to engage in such an important issue. Thank you for being willing to ask the question, what can I do to stop the violence? And I really do want us to prompt, to prompt you to bear that question in mind as we discuss the issue today. What can I do? We can talk about big campaigns and policy interventions and programs, and we will. But campaigns and such interventions are meaningless if they do not affect change in our lives. So whether you have personally been affected, whether you know someone who's been affected, or whether you are more generally concerned about the extent of gender-based violence in South African society, I encourage you to make the question personal. What can I do? I also just wanted to add a proviso to the discussion. We are aware that the nature of gender-based violence is diverse. It ranges from being wolf whistled at as you walk home to rape, to domestic abuse, to murder. It involves the victimization of gay and straight men and women, of men and women who dare to demonstrate alternative constructions of masculinity and femininity, of older and younger men and women, as well as children. Some have come through the experience as survivors, others have not been so lucky. So we are talking about a wide gambit of people and experiences. We acknowledge that. And while issues of violence against men based on gender are important issues to discuss, as we move into the period of 16 days of activism, we are focusing today on violence against women. And we're going to be talking about this topic quite broadly to try and uncover some of the similarities and common themes that might point in the direction of what we need to do to address the issue. Today, I just want to acknowledge that we have a few representatives from various campaigns here. You'll see the, the, the um, poster behind me for the Matla Abana initiative. Um, and, and in a short while, we will just acknowledge their campaign of Duct Tape Day, which they run in May during Child Protection Week as part of its mandate to get the conversation on abuse going. The message behind the duct tape is do not keep silent, speak out against abuse. We've also got a member from um, the Pink Eye Whistle campaign who we'll engage with during the discussion a little later. And then you'll see that we're all wearing black. Um, in acknowledgement of the Thursdays in Black campaign, which is a campaign of advocacy and solidarity against all forms of sexual and gender-based violence. Thursdays in Black encourages everyone, men and women, to wear black every Thursday. And it can be a campaign t-shirt, either black clothing, or simply a cam campaign badge as a sign of support. And I just wanted to ask if there's anybody else here today who represents a particular campaign or organization, and I'll give you one moment each to just mention your campaign. Nobody else? I know that there are hundreds of campaigns out there. Can I just mention, I'm not part of it, but Maria, uh, our new colleague, she is, uh, will represent uh, the circle of concerned theologians of, in Africa. Okay. That we had last Friday a conference on violence in women. So um, this is also something that we are engaged with. Good, great, thank you. Um, you, I think in acknowledgement of the, the Matla Habana initiative, uh, some of you have duct tape, and we just want to, if you can put the duct tape over your mouth and we'll have just a moment's silence.
Thanks very much. Uh, you will also see that you, you would have received a fact sheet when you came in, and um, on, the, on that fact sheet there's a story, Nosipo's story. Um, Nosipo is known to, to us at the centre and um, was very brave in putting her story out and felt that in this context she really wanted to, to be public about her story, so we thank her for her bravery in, in contributing that. Um, you will see the, the hashtags. If you want to be tweeting about the conversation today, please use those hashtags. Um, and we will, Nosipo's story will go onto our Facebook page and um, we'll continue the discussion there. So please do look out for that after the discussion today. So let me then start by introducing our esteemed panel. <laughs> I'm going to start with Lisa Vetten on the, on the end there. Uh, Lisa's worked variously as a trainer, researcher, and activist for, among others, people opposing women abuse, the Sexual Harassment Education Project, the Center for the Study of Violence and Reconciliation, and the Twaranang Legal Advocacy Center to End Violence Against Women. She holds a master's degree in political studies and is currently a PhD candidate in the same field. She serves as an honorary research associate at WISA, the Wits Institute for Social and Economic Research, as a member of the Shukumisa Campaign Steering Committee, and she's also a specialist advisor on violence against women to the Commission for Gender Equality. And she doesn't know it, but she was instrumental in my own consideration of, of gender issues when she gave a guest lecture in my second year crime and deviant sociology course, <laughs> which was many, many years ago. <laughs> And then Professor Gertie Pretorius over here. Um, she's a registered counselling psychologist, has been for the past 34 years, and is also a registered research psychologist. She holds a doctoral degree in psychology and a master's degree in philosophy, and has supervised more than 60 master's degrees and 21 doctoral degrees so far. Um, and that include, that's included in a variety of psychological fields. Her research niche is gender-based violence, and she's also the, chair, the vice chairperson of the HPCSA's professional board for psychology. Thanks. Shahana, sitting next to me, has been an activist, researcher, trainer, and academic in the field of gender for many, many years, with a particular focus on gender-based violence. She has a master's and doctorate from the University of Oxford. Uh, she's worked with many NGOs in both South Africa and Australia, and she's currently a lecturer in the Department of Social Work here at UJ. And then Dr. Kune Davis over there is a senior lecturer in the Department of Strategic Communication in the School of Communication. And she's a trustee for the Matla Bana um, NGO, which is, which is an NGO that campaigns against child rape and secondary abuse and has commenced working with specialists in other fields uh, in GBV organizations, as well as the SAPS units in Gauteng. Her current research focuses on local and national collaborative development of communication intervention campaigns and at destigmatization and destereotyping of rape and abuse victims and breaking the silence that envelops gender based violence in South Africa. So, thank you to all four of you for joining us today. <laughs> to start off with, I'm going to throw a general question to all four of you um, to, to just bring us all onto the same page, um, and that is, what are the key underpinning values and norms related to violence against women in South Africa? And we are going to have to use mics, so if you can grab one of the lapel mics, or we can pass the rolling mic. Shahana asked me especially not to start with her, so Bertie, can I start with you? Um, thank you. Uh, your question relating to what are the what, what underpins this is I think firstly we have to look at the context, uh, the patriarchal context that we live in, and um, I think the discourse that we have in terms of women and, and I know we're not talking about men today, but just for one moment I want to also. Um, bring to our attention that male on male rape is a really big reality and it also happens on a daily basis and some of our research also is about that. But I do think that the, the, the um, patriarchal society that we live in, the traditional discourses that we have, and we'll speak more about that a bit later, um, the, the um, <coughs> The almost um, ignorance 
that we, when, we, when we speak, we talk about the clothes she wore when she was raped, the, the places she went, uh, the fact that she put herself at risk. You know, she wore a conga, and therefore she, she um, um, was instrumental in her own rape and in, her own, um, in the violence perpetrated against her. So I think that is part of it. Um, I don't know whether, Kornay, do you want to go next? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think there's two things that I'd like to highlight around the values that underpin gender-based violence that we have to think of. And the first is this whole notion of the privatization. And I think that still continues where gender-based violence is seen as something that pri that's private. It happens in the relationship uh, and that the women must sort it out with the men or it must be sorted out in the relationship if it's a homosexual relationship. And so this abdicates people in the woman's environment from taking responsibility from assisting her. And I think that's something we really need to start looking at as a society because we think it happens behind closed doors. And a lot of our research shows that it's not. Many of us know about it, some of us witness it, or the women tell us about it, and we don't act to assist her. So I think that's the first thing I want to highlight. And the second value I'd like to ha highlight is the normalization. In many communities, women are sent back because it's seen as normal. Uh, mothers, mothers-in-laws say, it's happened to me. So, you know, it's normal. And so these two, I think, are the key things I'd like to start with highlighting. Yes, I think what also emerged from our initial um, findings and our investigations is the concept of stigma that that is perpetuating the silence that's perpetuating the gender-based violence. In most cases, and you'll see on all the, there's a, there's a lot of activity on, on websites and in social media, is the concept of stigma keeps coming up. And that is what causing, that's causing silence. People are too scared to speak. And there's a serious, a strong need for us to destigmatize rape survivors and abuse survivors. Because by making the topic uncommunicable, we make it impossible for victims to speak out. Because they don't even have the language. The language is silence, um, which makes it far more problematic. I think what I'd like to add, which often seems to disappear from the conversation almost immediately, are the words power and inequality. People often sp speak about gender and they remove the inequality and the social structure and foundation that I think sustains inequality between men and women and is of course mediated by a whole range of other social inequalities like race, class, sexual orientation, geographical location as well. I think the other construct that I've found very useful recently and I think I saw particularly in the Oscar Pistorius trial um, and then again I think when the, the vilification of Kelly Kumala after Senzo Meiwe was shot was the whole idea of um, ambivalent sexism. And this is the idea that, and this I think for me suggests that in South Africa, we have two kinds of sexism that act. Hostile sexism, which is active antipathy and prejudice towards women, and then a benevolent sexism, which reveres and venerates women for their special nurturing qualities. And I think we saw Reva Steenkamp in many ways being depicted in that way, the blameless, saintly victim. And this had a lot to do with, I think, um, the fact that she, and then if you look at Kelly Kumala, who got attacked and there was much hostility towards her, which had a lot to do around her sexuality. And so I thought it was very interesting in relation to Reva Steenkamp, how her mother came out at some point and said she never had sex with Oscar. So how much of women's value, worth, and judgments around them still are attached to sex? Women in some ways still remain chiefly defined as sex and as human afterwards. So I think ways of understanding sex in South Africa, how we have this dual way of looking at women that's both very hostile and suggests some women deserve it because of the way they get dressed. But other women don't because they're good women, they're mothers, we should nurture and care for them and so those things should never happen to them. That produces this ambivalence that I think we see sustains so much of violence in South Africa and I think continues to be perpetuating our policy when he wants to talk about women as vulnerable and needing men to protect them and needing men to man up so they can play a better role as protectors of women. And I think if we speak like that, we are going to continue to perpetuate the kind of framework that is keeping gender violence I think, so firmly entrenched in South Africa. Thanks very much. Uh, so many issues coming up here. And we're really talking about deep-seated values and norms. 
Um, in that context, how much can the kinds of campaigns, and particularly as we move towards 16 days, how, can these, how much can these campaigns actually do to start shifting these deep-seated values and norms? And maybe, Lisa, I'll start with you. <laughs> I mean, I think to pick up where I left, I left off, any campaign that begins from the basis of protectionism and women's vulnerability is not a useful campaign. I'm going to, I'm, and I'm sorry if any of you do run campaigns like that, but I don't think they are useful. Because first and foremost, what they do is they emphasize women's weakness. It doesn't emphasize their agency. And I mean, drawing on political theory, the minute you start to position somebody as, a, as being in need of a protection, they're not in need of protection, they're not entirely full citizens. And I think we must also ask, when we talk about women as vulnerable, it's very nice because we start to frame the problems being their weakness, their vulnerability, and we don't ask the follow-on question, well, why are they vulnerable? Who are they vulnerable to? What is making them vulnerable? So by focusing purely on their vulnerability, we remove the perpetrator's agency and what he's doing and his contribution. I don't think we fo and we're not necessarily focusing on women's capacity and agency and what they can do as well. Rather, we prefer to have them as special little people we can protect and look after. Um, so I think many of the campaigns that one saw last year, I remember um, a group of men got together and the, deputy, the then Deputy President, Khalema Motlante, addressed them and he talked about the need for us to save our women, as if we were wildflowers or rhinos. <laughs> so, you know, I think when we start talking about that kind of language, it's again very unhelpful. And especially if you want to talk about, I've seen it heard in many campaigns, it's time for men to man up. That's wonderful. What exactly does manning up mean? What does it mean in terms of entrenching particular norms around masculinity? Um, and manning up in the sense seem to be, men stop hurting women, go and protect them instead. Which is again, I think, the risk that gender-based violence face, that poses in particular is that it lends itself very easily to quite conservative framings of women as weak and in need of men's protection. Which I think is why, if one is not careful, it takes on a very quick popularity, but not in a way that challenges those deep-seated norms. Um, and I think, if I go back to the ideas around um, hostile and benevolent sexism that I was speaking about earlier, there's some very interesting research in South Africa that was done in the, the, about 2000 with 19 countries that were testing scales of hostile and benevolent sexism. And the interesting thing about South Africa was that it scored incredibly highly on both levels, with women demonstrating levels of benevolent sexism that were as high as men's. And what is so interesting about that is what the, or what the um, researchers have hypothesized is that women themselves will start buying into needing to see themselves in sexist ways if they live in a society where they are frightened of men and where to challenge might provoke hostility. So they may want, well want to be perceived as special, in need of protection, caring and nurturing as a way of trying to stay safe. So I think if we continue, if we don't try and think about how to make our campaigns more challenging, we are going to be running 16 days every year wondering why are they making no difference? Why, is all our, why are all our laws not changing? And that's because a law is merely the framework. It's what people give life to inside that framework, how they interpret it, how they think about it, how they'll say some women deserve protection but others don't, and so it can continue to be beaten or we're not really going to go investigate your rape because you just weren't paid, and that's why you're making these claims. I think we're just going to continue seeing the problem and creating a group of women who will per perpetually be seen as rapeable and beatable because they don't behave in acceptable ways. Thank you. I'm going to say something very controversial. And that is that campaigns don't change behavior. Campaigns can increase awareness, but we know that they don't change behavior. So if we really want to do something, we need to start on a societal level, and we need to start working preventatively. And we really need to change behavior from the bottom up and the work that has to be done has to be done within school systems has to be done within societies within communities with very young children um, and we need to the the agency and the and I really like what you said Lisa in terms of the agency of women and, and women have to be empowered and girl children have to be empowered um, to understand that her value is exactly the same as that of a man. And it's, we will speak later about some of the research in terms of traditions and traditional values 
Um, and how we, right from the beginning, start the constructs and, and, and construct the girl's value as different from that of the boy child. So, campaigns is good, we can talk, we can raise awareness, but if we want to, do, to change behavior, we need to do something different. And we, we actively need to launch behavior changing interventions. Yeah, I completely, <coughs> excuse me, I completely agree with Gertie. I think we have to look at prevention. We can't just be looking at awareness raising all the time, and this needs to be at programs that are developed at school level, looking at how do we change behavior. And if we're saying the basis of gender-based violence is gender inequality, then we have to look at how young boys and girls develop relationships at that young age. And this is where my research is going currently. But at the same time, I want to say that it took a long time for us to get these campaigns visible. I mean, it, for many years, <clears throat> we didn't talk about gender-based violence. And so we mustn't undermine the importance that we actually can have these conversations now, that we do have the legislation. And we need to use these opportunities to monitor the legislation, to, to keep our governments, to keep our society, to keep us accountable to, the, to these promises that we've made in the Constitution and in our legislation. So uh, we need to use our campaigns to get action. Uh, so, you know, not just raise awareness, but we mustn't forget that actually getting to this point took us a long time. It took a lot of activism to get 16 days of activism, International Women's Day. So we, we start to take them for granted and we don't use them effectively. But it's been a long road getting there. And so how do we use these opportunities to hold systems accountable for, for, for what they should be doing to promote gender inequality? I hear what we're saying about campaigns because we know that they come and go and we all have various campaigns and I believe they all serve a purpose in their own way but what we're talking about is real change, Inter the ability to intervene and my theory about this after the, I'm the new kid on the block, I started with the gender-based violence research in 2013 when our students were tasked with a project to develop a strategic conceptualization for Matla Abana, which none of them actually heard of at the time, but it, it just started from there. And I've done a lot of homework since, and what we realized is that the silence that is perpetuating the gender-based violence to a lot of and for various reasons, as we said, I mean, it must be the perception, it must be dealt with at home, and don't have your dirty laundry out in public, and some women deserve it, and all these perceptions. The problem is still that women will not speak out if they cannot do it anonymously at first. Now we understand. You cannot prosecute anybody. You cannot send in jail anybody. We've got 106 family violence courts that will be established within the next few years. We've got a commitment for, as announced at the sexual offence in Daba that, that, that there's a lot being done from the government side. We've got the Tutu Zela centres, which, which some are working well. We have all of that, but at the end of the day, to to do, we have to start somewhere, and I believe that if we can enable women to speak anonymously, that their identity is protected, because I think only people who have experienced fear would understand fear, and that women are terrified of not only of, of the, the perpetrators and retaliation, but it, it's, it's the family, it's the, it's the pride of the family, it's the name of the family, it's the, it's, it's the stigmatization, again, it boils down to stigmatization. And if we can find ways to destigmatize survivors, then I believe we'll get somewhere. I think that's a step in the right direction. Did you want to add something, Lisa? <laughs> I am coming to you straight away with another question, so you can add on if you'd like. Um, you've recently been doing research, particularly on the policy frameworks and funding mechanisms around uh, this, this issue. Where would you say the gaps are um, in the, at the policy level, and, and what needs to be changed at this level? Which aspects continue to be neglected? Is there any way we can get a second line? I want to go back to this. It sounds like I'm a, I'm a stuck record. <laughs> but I mean, there's very much, I think, one must look at words, the meaning of words never stays the same. And gender is one of the words that has undergone some of the most dynamic 
interesting and unhelpful transformations in South Africa. If anything, I think now you could almost describe gender as being co-opted in the sense that it now has come to mean in government circles something so unhelpful I wouldn't want to use the word gender anymore. But if you talk to now um, some of my research focus on departments of social development, what does gender equality mean? No, it means treating men and women in the same way. It's a very formal notion of equality. How does that translate in policy terms? Well, if we give battered women shelters, then we must give battered men shelters. And in fact, you must put the battered men in the same shelter with the battered women. And if women will not, and if women's shelters will not take those men in, then they are discriminating. That's a fascinating understanding of gender equality. But it's one that is quite, that is very pervasive within the Department of Social Development. So I think it's looking at how the words start to get used and what they mean to policymakers and how they can move from, I think, something that is sometimes quite radical and transformatory into something that is dumbed down. Which is why I've always thought gender mainstreaming is an interesting word because while mainstreaming might mean trying to put it into the sense of things, for things to become mainstream can also mean they've become dumbed down and very dull. And I think that's what happens with quite a lot of gender's more provocative ideas. They get turned down and made acceptable because there's something very uncomfortable about talking about gender relations. Um, I think many of these stigma, many of the stereotypes persist around horrible feminists. I think it's a worse F word than the four letter one. I'm sure people more. So I think <laughs> for that reason, people try and tone it down to be nice, to be likable, to be to be seen as friendly, not some sort of hairy legged man hating whatever. And I think because of the stigma that attaches to feminism, it can make it quite difficult to bring that more challenging content back into policy. So you see a lot of policy, I think being watered down constantly. And one of the most interesting shifts, not only in relation to how gender equality is being understood, has been the way, um, in, in relation to violence, is also how understandings of family have crept back into, in quite conservative ways. So you can see in policy how women, prior to 1994, are firmly subsumed within the family. They have no identity separate from the family. Then you can see between 94 to 97, especially if you look through the Domestic Violence Act, they emerge as autonomous citizens with rights in their own right. Then you start seeing them being moved into this category of vulnerable people, along with children, people with disabilities, and the elderly. And by 2011, in the white paper on families, you have the Department of Social Development saying, we shouldn't even be talking about a department of women and children anymore. We should be having family departments. And starting to tell women's organizations, you must stop calling yourself so-and-so women's organization, you are so-and-so family organization. So you have women having this brief period coming out as individuals in their own right and being restored right back into the family. The interesting thing about that family policy is you can see within social work, there's often quite a strong emphasis on family preservation. But you can see in the early policy of about 2000, 2006, when the department emphasizes family preservation, that we say this is not to come at the expense of the safety of women and children. By the 2011 um, white paper, that caveat has disappeared altogether. And in fact, it's not even about the goals of family preservation and dealing with domestic violence, it's not even about helping women to live independently. It's about how to make the abuser stop behaving abusively so that we can keep the family together. So it's to say the policy framework hasn't changed. It's the meanings and the way people have started to apply them that has shifted. I think if you look at a whole lot of policy within governments, especially from 2009 onwards, but I do think it began before then, you can see far greater social conservatism returning. Um, and I think, in some ways, a rollback of some of the, of, of, of the policy. Shahana, moving from the policy level, your research really focuses on the interpersonal and the societal relationships, um, the, the interpersonal support mechanisms. What are the major challenges that you've identified with regard to the help-seeking efforts of women in abusive situations? Thanks so much. I think it really boils on, on what Lisa was saying around this notion of family preservation. That is so strong in communities and families about women often don't want to leave because of the best interests of the child. And this came out very strongly in the interviews. That, um, and at the same time, when they saw that their children were at risk, they were more likely to leave. 
So children then played a very big role in whether women stayed in abusive relationships and also then whether they chose to leave. Was they didn't choose necessarily to leave because of their own safety, but because of the safety of their children when they saw that their children were being harmed. Also these notions of love and happily ever after marriages was very powerful in keeping women in abusive relationships. Um, and then obviously there's some of the other usual ones that we know about, <clears throat> which is fear. You know, a, a fear for their physical safety because they, they're isolated, they, they kept away from families. But beyond some of these uh, psychological and the immediate factors, there are a lot of the factors around society and how women are not supported. And this whole issue and notion of silence, we need to really question. So there are women who are silent and don't speak, but many do. And they often speak into family and friends uh, who are sending them back. They're going to social services, they're going to police. And it often takes many efforts of help seeking before they actually get helped. And so there's, it's, it's a long process before they finally find effective help. And one of the most effective help seeking strategies was actually when they get to a shelter. Um, and that was the one space where they could actually find a way to get out because the economic dependence um, is one of the other key reasons that they can't leave abusive relationships. And the shelter helps them overcome that. But before that, it's a very long process of not being helped effectively. Thanks, Shahana. Um, some of what Shahana is speaking to is exactly what you're dealing with, Corne. It's, um, it's the community level interventions, what's happening with, at the police, what's happening with different organizations that are supposed to be providing help seeking and that women are not necessarily getting that. So on the one hand, there's the issue that you talk about that women don't feel safe talking out. And then what Shahana is raising is that when they do talk out, there's these multiple barriers that they face. And um, what do you think are the major characteristics of the relationship between in, in the relationships in the community and at the particularly the police? I know you've been working very closely with. What needs to be improved on in this area? This is the thing with the difficult situation at the moment with regards to trust issues with the police and. The reason is not that the police officers aren't trustworthy and do a remarkable job. The problem is that the communication is not positive. So the success stories of the police are not communicated. Uh, we were, was, I was at the Incentive Awards. There are organizations who make an effort to, to support the police in what they are doing because the police are also human beings. We had an incident, or we were reported an incident recently, where one of the senior investigating officers in the Family Violence and Sexual Offence Unit's daughter committed suicide with his service pistol. So people are not aware of what police are going through and their experiences as human beings. Uh, it's, it's criticism and pointing out what the police are not doing that, that is a problem, because that is what's that's getting communicated. So that does not encourage relationships. So there's communication intervention required in that regard as well to publicize the good work that police officers do and to work with the provincial, um, at the moment we met with, uh, with Major General Mosikiri who was at one of our events. We had Lieutenant Colonel Pizzana, I don't know if he's arrived yet, I haven't got my glasses on, who was going to see us. But they were here, they were present, they want to establish relationships. And we've got to let communities allow them the opportunity to create the relationships. We've got to start somewhere with the trust. Yes, not all the police officers, unfortunately, we've got a history of all sorts of bodies with reputations and incidents, and that does happen. But they're not all like that. And we need to introduce communities to the people who do make a difference who do go beyond the call of duty, of the convictions that do happen. We had the case now in, 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 in the Cape in this week on Tuesday where a pedophile, Renee Krauser, was sentenced five years for distributing child pornography. And we need to communicate these success stories. And we need to communicate that, in, that individuals can trust the police to take action. And the most interesting thing was that this Renee Krauser was sentenced was a child therapist. So there, there's a need to also get alertness that the communities can communicate with the police, that they can be, feel free to share their stories. Otherwise, we're getting nowhere because 
the cases, majority of cases, are not reported. That's the biggest problem with gender-based violence and rape and child rape. It's not reported. So we have to establish relationship between communities and police if we need to get anywhere. Thanks. Question? Yeah. Uh, can I uh, come back to you and just say we're talking about... Um, communities trusting the police and that there needs to be some communication from the police side to communities to to um, make people aware of the good work of police. Is there not also room to communicate to the police about the potential that they have to re-victimize people and not to help? Because many of the police might hold some of the very deeply seated attitudes that we spoke about earlier. Um, and, and when a woman does come to report something, they may be re-victimized with questions like, well, what were you wearing? Where were you? Is there something that needs to happen there as well? Do I just quickly add? Because <laughs> this is very controversial. I mean, Lisa and I have been working on police trailing for what, from 15 years ago and developing relationships with the police. So I don't think working with the police is in any way a new area. And I think uh, local organizations have very good relationships with, with local police stations where they are based, but this is not a widespread issue. And so, I mean, I think this is a much bigger issue. <laughs> I don't know if you want to do it. Yes, it is a complex issue. Like, communication typically is. It's a very complex phenomenon. And it is important because what you're saying is true. I've heard many stories myself of people who have not been taken seriously. Cases that have not been prosecuted. Like I say, we hear a lot of that. But somewhere there must be a communication platform where we can speak with the provincial officers, where we can say, but this is reported. Communities are saying that they can address the issues in those branches of the police where it's not working. There's got to be some level of transparency and, and, and some perception of that we being heard, that the police listen to the people and the people listen to the police. Um, if, if we're going to make any progress in that regard. I was expecting Shahana to steal the microphone yeah. again. Gertie, <laughs> 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 uh, your, your research is focusing on women for whom all of these interventions have failed. Um, from their perspective, what would you say are the major challenges for women seeking to escape violence? Uh, thank you, Lauren. Yes. Um, Thus far, we have interviewed about 375 incarcerated women who were, were found guilty um, and have prison sentences for killing their abusive partners. In other words, we're looking at where finally the, the, the cycle of violence completed itself. And um, of all these women that we interviewed, we also did some, um, it, it, a whole mixed methodology, but th I'm talking about these in particular. Everybody had the same story. She went to the police. She got a restraining order. She went to the social services. She went to her religious leaders. She went to her own mother and her own father and her own sister and to his mother who told her, you must be doing something wrong. Go home and be a good wife. If you're a good wife, he won't hit you. And what Johanna said earlier in terms of when, we also investigated in my research the, the triggers. What was the trigger that actually led to that particular killing? And those who did it impulsively, on the moment, in the spur of the moment, often wanted to protect the children. And I can relay stories of women who, um, at the stage where she had to, to have sex in front of her children, then did the deed, then she killed them. Um, there's lots of very interesting things that I can mention, but when these women come to trial, the most important discrimination happens. Because when a man kills someone in self-defense, he can use the self-defense issue. When a woman kills someone in self-defense, she must use the battered woman syndrome. In other words, 
A woman who kill must be mad. We must pathologize her. Um, and many of these women, and you, we also, we, we even saw it in the Barbie, Advocate Barbie case where she tried to use the better woman sy syndrome. That's a totally different story because she was a perpetrator herself. Um, but when this cycle of violence, and we will talk a little bit more later when we talk about traditional values and so on, when this cycle of violence completes itself, we fail in the final instance in the court. We fail these women again. Um, and they must have a diagnosis, a, patho a pathology, rather than, but if a man killed someone, it was self-defense. Um, some of the very interesting uh, factors that I really didn't expect in our research was the difference between women who kill her abusive partner herself and women who hire a third party. That was very interesting. And I wonder whether um, we can, uh, you guys can, can come up with what was the distinctive difference between them. Um, it was level of education. Women with a higher level of education hired a third party rather than uh, do it themselves. Um, the psychological factors, we, we, we looked into, can we draw up a profile of the woman that will be vulnerable to become the perpetrator herself? Um, and there's some very interesting um, biological factors, and we used the 16PF um, uh, to do that and uh, uh, to look at that. And um, I, can, oh, I can only refer us to the, the publications around that. Thank you, thanks. Let's move on to talking about the language and messaging in the area of violence against women. And, and Lisa, you've touched on, on some of these issues around um, uh, placing women in a position of vulnerability again through the campaigns that we've been, we've been looking at, or, or saying that she's only worth, worth protecting if she p portrays a particular kind of femininity and in a particular context. Um, so beyond talking about, how do we start talking about women's agency in the kind of campaigns that are, that are gearing up, uh, we're gearing up for as we move towards 16 days of activism and other campaigns. What is the best way of communicating the nature of violence against women and what needs to be done? I mean, I've always felt quite ambivalent about the whole idea of promoting, the, of promoting women speak out because that puts the onus on women to do something, which I think is important, especially if you're talking about their agency. But it's quite clear from the way we're speaking that women do speak, and they tell a lot of people. The problem is actually us and the way we listen. So the campaign should probably be something around how well do you listen, rather than women speak out. So I would prefer to see campaigns that shift to that in place of the that responsibility that Shahana was talking about, is to who act, violence doesn't occur in a vacuum. It requires a context to condone it, to look the other way, to say go back. So, why don't, so as long as we continue to individualize it within that woman, instead of throwing it open to look at how do we challenge the context, this our silence that we don't break, then I think we're going to continue the problem. So that's one thing I would like to see, perhaps to shift away from telling women to break the silence, to look at how do we get people to listen much better. That would be the one thing. I would also like to just move away from images of women huddled in the shower. I really know that kind of imagery. I know it's very affecting because you know, this idea of trying to clean yourself, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but it, it, again, it goes back to the woman's shame. And it would be useful to start to move away from those ideas because I wonder to what extent do they just reinforce the idea of stigma? You're sitting there in the shower trying to wash mm. the shame away from yourself. So I would, I'm not necessarily suggesting we have beaming, happy women skipping through the fields, mm. but. Um, I do think we need to think about our imagery around violence against women that focuses less on helplessness, on victimization, on shame, and on silence. Um, so I think there'd be that to look at. I also think it would be very nice if we started running campaigns around, if a woman is unconscious, that is not consent. Don't have sex with her. So if we started targeting campaigns around men, to men around, what does enthusiastic consent look like? 
You know, let's, let's put the onus back around what, do, what does that look like? When last did you ask for consent, or did you just assume it because her skirt was very short and she was very high at the time? So I think if we started looking at, that might be considerably more challenging than consistently asking women to speak out and whatever. So I'm, I'm thinking if we were to start shifting some of the imagery and some of the language and to make it less benevolent and less paternalistic, that might also help. And I also think it's not always very helpful to say to people, stop doing this. Because what's the behavior you suggest they exchange it for? Because I mean, a lot of our behavior serves a particular purpose. And if you take away that, take away that behavior, it's like when you say to people, don't hit your child. I think it's quite right people say, well then how must I discipline my child instead? So I think if you're going to tell people to change behavior, instead of telling them what they shouldn't do, it might be more helpful to say, what you should do, what is helpful behavior, what is different, what is constructive. Because just say, no, don't do that. Well, okay, what do I do next? So I think if we maybe started looking at um, that kind of, that kind of, if we, if we tried to start shifting some of our thinking like that, I think if we also nuanced our campaigns. People are different, they are of different age groups, they come from different social circumstances. One message does not work for everybody. But yet we get the same sets of messages over and over again as if everybody is the same and listens in the same way. So I think we need to get a lot more subtle and talk to, pe and talk to different groups of men and women in the kind of language and thinking that um, would appeal. And they wouldn't just switch off and go, oh no, not that again. Do you want to jump in? Yes, I would okay. like to jump in. I want to take us to a different level of language. And look at the messages that we sent and even the messages that the court sent. Uh, you know, Oscar Pistorius got five years for killing Reva. Do you know what, you, what the minimum sentence is for killing a rhino? Ten years. Oh. And, and Gertie, you, you, the, the, you know, when you talk about how the kind of defenses that are available for women who kill their partners, it also speaks to, to the way the systems fail them. Um, Kone, you've been doing a lot of work around communication and the ways in which um, communication serves, uh, often serves to re-victimize or, or stigmatize people who do speak <laughs> out and who do seek, um, um, seek help. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the way that language has been used to do that and what we need to do to shift that language? The thing is, I think first we must look at that we're not using one language that there are multiple language with multiple voices, tying up with what you said, Lisa. There are so many voices out there that often contradict each other. We are in the age of women's liberation. We get magazines that, 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 that says women should be empowered, they should be assertive, they should uh, em embody their own, that they, they have their autonomy, and that speaks out, that, that is some message from some vein. But then we also have totally contradictory message, like you say. Now, the poor victim was the helpless woman. And women are confused about these multiple identities. And that is perpetuated through the use of language that's, that's contradictory. So we're never going to have one language. We have to accept that. We're never going to have one stance. We're now sitting at the situation where at Parliament they are busy renegotiating the age of sexual consent. What is that communicating? How confusing is that language? That now uh, it, it's, it's debated whether the, the age must be dropped to 15 and it's even being said 12. I haven't seen that verified. But it's being said. So what is, what, what is that language saying? What is it communicating? I was horrified the other day. I come off and I fortunately I'm, I'm, I'm quite, I communicate a lot. It's, my, it's what I do. So I, I communicate <laughs> with, my, with my child, who is a 12-year-old little girl, and, and I, I believe it's my responsibility to educate and inform her um, about all these, these things. So unfortunately, I do, because when I come off the highway from fetching, getting her from school, I've got signs there, post, post, posted there, on saying um, penis enlargements and a number to phone. What kind of language is that, 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 that we, that's accepted. Nobody has actually pulled them off. They're sitting there. So the language that society is using, and it's not always verbal. Language is not only verbal, it's also non-verbal language. 
by allowing these kind of things or saying, no, that is a freedom of expression. We can all have our say. We must just understand that we're having contradictory meanings through the language that we are using and that it's got its consequences. So if we want to change, we, we understand we're never going to have one language. We must just be clear about what we are saying. And silence is also a language. Kuitake consentire videtur. You is silent. It's taken to agree. We've got to understand the language of silence. Yes, I think you're quite right about what we communicate because that is definitely not what is happening with the law. The age of consent is 16. It's not changing, it's not dropping, it's not getting higher and it's not getting lower. All that's changing is that children between the ages of 12 and 15 who consent to having sex with each other mm. will no longer be charged with a crime. They will no longer be criminalized and have to go through the criminal justice system. But it remains wrong to have sex under the age of 16. The challenge will be how do you, when you deal with two consent, children who've consented under that age, how do you then deal with them without having to make them go to court and go through the justice system? But the law is not saying go ahead and have sex and have babies and whatever. It's just saying don't put them in prison and make them go through trials. Yeah, that's good because that was good. So. Thanks. Um, I want to address this to both of you, Shahana and Gertie. In, in the area of domestic violence, we often hear the question, why doesn't she leave him? Or if, in, in the situation of rape, as you mentioned, Gertie, what was she wearing? Where was she? The whole idea that she herself is, um, is party to her victimization. How do we respect the agency of the victim while recognizing her state, status as a victim and the, in the language that we use? Um, very, very recently we published some research on um, women who stay in abusive relationships. And what we did is we looked, because it's true that people stay for, women stay for economic reasons and women stay for the sake of the children, etc. That's true. We did some research and we looked at employed women who are educated, who still stay in abusive relationships. And we looked at, at black South African women, black African South African women who stays in abusive relationships. And it was absolutely, it was a phenomenological research project. And it was fascinating that all of them told the story of their traditional values. How from a very young age women are taught, are, are, are taught that a man is different and a man is like a, and, and those of you who, who's in Sitswana will know this, a man is like a pumpkin <coughs> and he, he, he can go into the neighbor's yard. Do you know what I'm talking about? You, you, you know, from, from, a, from, a, from, a, young, from a, a young age. So, and then the whole um, construct of Labola came in. And women's perception, their own perception, not, not the the men's perception, their own perception of what it means to have gone through this process and, and your responsibilities and your duties towards your husband once the Labola process has been finalized. So that was very interesting research and many of them said, but I can go and I should go, but that will make me a bad wife and that will make me a bad woman, and I will bring shame on my family. So that is an important reason for women to stay as well, from this reason. Thanks, I think that your research has very similar findings, that sort of women, <coughs> reasons they don't leave is sort of at different levels, you know, the social, personal, uh, cultural, economic, etc. But I think that we know that the rape happens everywhere and, and the potential for anyone to be a victim, it's not necessarily about dress. Women in hijab get raped as well, unfortunately. Children get raped. Um, and often the perpetrator is known to the victim um, and it's not always strangers. Um, and so I think we need to move to a, a no tolerance for domestic violence, for abuse of any kind. And we need to look at how do we prevent this for future generations because 
uh, so much of the research shows that children who witness domestic violence are more likely to be victims and per or perpetrators, perpetrators. So we have to start looking at prevention and looking at how this is a societal issue and not just this private issue between this couple and change our language that it's our responsibility, not just uh, the victim's responsibility. And very much so about how do we look at the responsibility of the perpetrator. W w why was the perpetrator in the place? Well, you know, what was he wearing? No one says, you know, if a guy doesn't have his T-shirt on that he wants to be raped. So, which doesn't mean we're not saying that men can't get raped because we also know that a lot of our young boys are, uh, so, um, yes, exactly, well, you know, they're victims of rape. Uh, and the, the, the statistics for young boys is also very high. Uh, and so it's not an area we should be excluding. Um, I think we should also talk about the different types of abuse against women, you know, um, financial abuse, emotional abuse, psychological abuse, that, that whole idea, and I always say how important it is for us to, to teach our daughters, you know, I taught my daughter, the first time he says to you, your lipstick is too bright, you leave him, <laughs> because it, there, there's this incremental thing that happens in abusive relationships. And it, it literally starts with um, him telling her what to wear mm -hmm. and what not to wear. And let's not go to the Oscar Pistorius trial in terms of that, you know. Um, how Riva asked him permission to wear a particular Rocky um, y y little dress, you know. Um, so, so all those different types of abuse, and, and we, it's our duty to tell our daughters what the process is and how it incrementally increases from, and it's very um, seductive, and it's very charming, and it's um, a, a, a big compliment because now he's, he's a little bit jealous. That means that he likes me a lot, you know. I, he doesn't want other men to look at me. And then she starts falling for that until she's so isolated that she has no contact with her friends. Uh, we need to, to educate young women about how it happens so that they can be aware and that they can see it happen and they can leave him. And presumably young men as well. And of course, yes, young men. I do want to pick up on men because I've often wondered, the reason why violence against women began as an issue in Europe and North America was because it had been invisible, it had been very neglected, um, and the big focus was largely on crimes traditionally committed against men. South Africa is interesting because post-94, there was an extraordinary focus on violence against women, which, is not, which, was, which was really very unusual if you compare it internationally. And I think what, however may one critique it, there is a, a great degree of sensitivity to the levels of violence against women in South Africa. And what I think we not, and I'm not, and people often want to get this into a zero-sum game and let's play men and women off against each other, which I think is not helpful. But I do think we have to look at men's extraordinary levels of violence towards each other in South Africa. Because if you want to start using the word language, if you want to use the word vulnerable in its descriptive sense as being susceptible to harm or injury, then the vulnerable group in this country are young men. They, they murder each other at a rate, something like six times the rate that oh, they, that women are killed in this country. Mm. It's, it really is staggering. But what is so interesting is that, is, and here again is why I start to think we're reinforcing gender stereotypes in some of our messaging, is that we continue to call women vulnerable instead of men. And once you start making vulnerable a feminized word, it's going to be very hard for men to own up and say, I am a victim, because the word has become so very feminized and has such feminine connotations to it. Also, I think there's a great relationship between violence generally. It seems to me that when you have high levels of violence against women, you probably have high levels of other forms of violence as well. So if you want to tackle violence against women, I think you also have to tackle other forms of violence as well, which means starting to problematize men's violence towards each other. Because in a funny way, the message we might just be giving is men carry on having to step up a lip and suck it up and shut up when you get hurt but just don't hurt women. Women are allowed to scream and shout, um, and you mustn't hit them. Otherwise, you just carry on doing whatever you do, it is, it is you do to each other, and you keep quiet about it like real men do. So I'm almost wondering if we don't have to start shifting the messages to start thinking about some of that without losing the understanding of how gender 
mediates violence, or maybe how violence genders. I'm not too sure some days which it actually is. But I'm sometimes thinking that maybe we need to start looking at how violence is implicated in gender, and it means men also experience a great deal of violence, but it's not in the forms of domestic and sexual violence. It's in very high levels of other kinds of, of violence, and that, that really needs to be tackled as well, because you could argue, argue at the end of the day that perhaps all forms of violence are actually based in notions of gender and how, <coughs> how we should behave towards each other, depending on whether we define as men or women. I'm so sorry. No, what, what Lisa says um, was echoed in our research on male on, in male on male rape. In terms of that a man can, in most of the notions that we have, and specifically in the feministic notion, can only be a perpetrator or a hero. He can't be a victim. Um, and we saw that, and that was part of why men can't speak out after they've been raped. comes back to the issue of stigma, of course. <laughs> um, I think we've raised a number of really interesting points here. And um, it, what, what we're talking about is, I want to return to the question I started with, with what can I do, coming back to my own agency, as a man, as a woman, what can I do? Um, Lisa, your, your, your idea of the, the campaign around what does it look like to have active or enthusiastic consent, interestingly enough, was something that was um, part of a campaign on university campuses in the US during the, this initial hazing period, that they party period that they have at the beginning of their academic year, and went viral um, a lot across US campuses. Very, very effective campaign. Um, and that really does place the, the onus, the agency on, on people in a, in a relationship, uh, whatever form that relationship takes, of negotiating consent. Beyond that, what, what kind of messages, and this is a question to all four of you, what kind of messages do we need to be looking at that place, that foreground our agency? Our agency, women's agency if they're in situations of violence, men's agency if they're in situations of violence or perpetration, uh, but particularly our agency as, as people who, who women may speak out to. Thanks, Laura. I think I would like to go back to this issue of us as community, family, friends, that we need to take action. When women speak to us, the thing of what Lisa was saying is how do we listen and how do we respond? And, and how do we ensure that the systems that are in place, such as the Domestic Violence Act and the role of the police, that they act as they should be acting? And sorry, we also need to be working on prevention. I, I really think that if we're not working with young children and we're not looking at these issues at that level and it's not part of our curriculum, we're failing because 10 years later when a woman reports is way too late. Um, we haven't spoken about corrective rape yet, but maybe we can speak about that a bit later um, in, in the uh, questions and answer uh, part. I think we've, we had a good start. We started with awareness raising and I think let's acknowledge that we, where we are because of some of that. But if I think we, start, we need to start by changing the discourse. Um, we need to start by changing the discourse and I think we need to develop preventative interventions. Active interventions and we need to start very young at school level. I agree with um, Brock Gertie that intervention is the only way to go. But like Lisa rightly said, there's not one message, one fits all. It's got to be tailored for specific audiences if we want to have the intervention, the communicative intervention. And we need the participate, participation of, of society in, 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 in its different hubs, but we still need the support of society. I mean, there was the quote, and I can't remember who said it, but that there never will be enough police to enforce a law that's not supported by the people. Then it's by the people. So we have to accept our responsibility to participate. But society also needs to be informed because, unfortunately, because of also our information overload, uh, there's ignorance. So 
we don't really want to know. There's so much misery around. How much more misery do we want to listen to? But it's not that. It's the consequences of not listening that we must understand. We didn't become one of the crime capitals out of the blue. The, the perpetrators didn't exactly hatch out of eggs. We've got to accept that there's, there's an accountability, responsibility, participation if we want to change things. And that means that we have to communicate about an uncomfortable topic, like what Bishop Desmond Tutu said. It's not comfortable to speak about it, but we don't have an option because the consequences are too big for our society at large. I think what, what might be quite useful is to drop like, lists of 10 things that you can do, whether that ranges from, you know, if, you, if, you're seeing, if you're seeing somebody being hit in the street, how do you intervene? I mean, a lot of people struggle with what should I do? and are worried about um, being abused themselves. So I think one could draw up a set of very practical things that people could do, you know, like if you belong to a community policing forum, how do you make sure that your police station is um, friendly to, to survivors of rape or domestic violence? How do you support your local organization? How can you contribute or volunteer somewhere? So I think if you had perhaps developed lists of, of 10 very simple, easy things for people to do, that would be very helpful because not every dismantle patriarchy or you're like, where you start? But I mean, I think s easy practical things are, anyone can achievable do, anyone, things. achievable things that, that people can do. And I really do think that if we can find ways to make people think about how they listen. Mm. Um, most of us want women to leave the first time they get hit. And if they don't, well, then they're clearly a volunteer. There's an expression, first time victim, second time a volunteer, something like that. I mean, that's not useful either. So I think it's also trying to listen and accept that we can't expect victims to behave in the way we would like them to. And I think the other really important thing is to allow women to be badly behaved. Because very often we expect our victims to be saintly. And if they perhaps shouted back and threw something or sulked or lay in bed and didn't cook the dinner, well. So I think if we allowed women to be human, it would be it would be really it would be a really nice thing, um, and didn't expect uh, some sort of better standard of behaviour. That might also be helpful, I think, in terms of, of dismantling stereotypes. And I would also, without wishing to encourage in men that they go and wallow in victimhood, but that we start looking at how the relationship between masculinity and vulnerability, and how we make that something to challenge as well. Yeah, and it, it seems to come down to issues of masculinity and femininity and really challenging our very conservative notions of masculinity and femininity and sexuality. Um, and it seems from what you're saying, um, what you're saying about the, the, the legal frameworks and what you were saying, Gertie, that, that actually we're moving more and more towards conservatism, which is, which is somewhat worrying. 